Lord shall rejoice in his works. And in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, I don't think anybody believes this wonderful passage of Scripture. If we did, we'd act like President Wilson and do a little two-step out of sheer joy. It says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love, he will joy over thee with singing. God Almighty is in the midst of us. He will save and rejoice over us with joy. God is happy if nobody else is, and he will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing, the eternal God singing. That's why I want our congregations to sing. I don't require that they sing on pitch, just that they sing with joy and enthusiasm. I don't mind if the piano is out of tune, or if one fellow is singing a little step behind the next fellow. That doesn't bother me. But the lack of warmth and enthusiasm makes me question the experiential life of Christians. The Christian church has God in it, and wherever God is, God will joy over his people with singing. The singing of the church reflects the great God singing among his people. I notice that Jesus Christ our Lord said about his church in Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 9, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one glance of thine eyes. When the Lord says this about his church, it can only mean one thing. He feels toward his church as a bridegroom toward his bride, as a mother toward her child, as a lover toward the object of his affection. And there's a highly satisfying love content in true Christianity if you go deep enough. The trouble is, we don't go deep enough. Deal Moody told about a man who had never slept on a feather bed. He found a feather, lay down on it all night, and said, If one feather is that hard, I can't imagine what a whole bed of them would be like. Moody was joking, but it illustrates something. We get just enough religion to make us miserable. If we would go on, we'd find God's love. All that some people know about Christianity is that it won't let you do things. A man once told Spurgeon, I don't drink, I don't use tobacco, I don't swear, I don't attend theater. Spurgeon replied, Do you eat hay? He said, No, I don't. What do you mean? And Spurgeon said, I hoped you did something. Up to now, you've been doing nothing. And to some people, Christianity is only what you don't do. That's not Christianity. The monks don't do much. The man in India that goes naked and sleeps on spikes doesn't do much either. He just lies around and rots, but that's not Christianity. There's a love content in Christianity, and discounting all the irresponsible things people do, there is nevertheless a deep, healing emotional content in the Christian life. That's why the Bible calls the church the bride and Christ the bridegroom. He means that his people should know his love and that we should feel it and sense it. I'm trying to analyze love, yet you can't describe love. You've got to feel it. You can see how it works, but you can't describe it, and you don't know it until you've felt it. So it is with the love of God. It says in Hosea chapter 2, verse 16, that the time would come when they would no more call God Baalai, a rejected name for God, but Ishai, meaning husband. That means that God wants to be to us what a husband is to a new wife. He wants to shelter and care for and love and cherish us. I've often wondered why women were willing to change their name when they get married. When Marcia Smith marries Mortimer Jones, one of the first things he'll say to her as they ride away with their hair full of rice is, Well, Mrs. Jones, how are you? And she giggles. She's delighted to take his name. I know many a newlywed husband who has had his wife paged at the hotel, paging Mrs. Mortimer Jones, and she says, Oh, this is wonderful. She's taken the name of the man she loves and doesn't mind it at all. Well, your maiden name was Adam. Don't forget that. But the Lord wanted to give you a new name. He said, I'll be your husband, and you'll be called Christian. The love of God has made us Christians and has joined us to Him in the warmth of affection. What a mechanical business marriage would be if there was no love in it. What a mechanical business rearing children would be. Wouldn't it be awful getting up five times a night to give them a glass of water they don't need, fixing bumps they should never have had, looking at those awful report cards? Raising a family would be terrible, except for one thing, the lubrication of love. 
Whenever love is there, everything is all right. There is a little story about a very young girl who was carrying around a great big lug of a baby on her back. A man came by and said to her, Well, honey, that's quite a burden you have there. And she said, That's not a burden, that's my little brother. Whatever you love isn't a burden. God is not having any burdens. That's why I never join in with people that are pitying the Lord. Never. God is happy to do what he did. He is love, and love is joyful. If I were to try to talk about the greatness of love, I would only run in circles, because I can't speak of that which cannot be spoken of. But to break it down a little, this love of God is an attribute of God, which means it is eternal, immutable, and infinite. It never began to be, and it can never end. It can never change, and there is no boundary to it. For the love of God is broader than the measures of man's mind, and the heart of the Eternal is most wonderfully kind. Every time God thinks about you, He thinks about you lovingly. Even if He must chastise you or allow hardships to come to you, it is love that allows it to come and love that sends it. And we never should be afraid of love because love casts out fear. We talk about love, but God proved His love. But God commendeth, that is, proves, his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, it says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The same love that created us is the love that redeemed us and now keeps us. The best preservative in the world is the love of God. Some people believe in the security of the saints from theological grounds. They take it from a text somewhere. I believe in the security of the saints because God is love and God always keeps that which He loves. We always keep what we love, always. I hate to take the other side, but I just have to say this. The soul that can scorn such infinite, emotional, eager love as this, the soul that can trample it down, turn away from it, and despise it, will never enter God's heaven. Never. That soul would never be happy in God's heaven. That soul that loves hate and hates love, the soul that cultivates hate and despises the love of God, would never be happy in heaven above. Sometimes when a wicked old scoundrel dies, the preacher gets up and tries to preach them right into heaven, not knowing that the worst thing that could happen to them would be to go to heaven. I once read the story of a very rich man who found a little urchin sleeping in an old empty barrel down by the waterfront. The child was dressed in rags and picked up what he could get around the alleys and wherever anybody would give him a handout. The rich man decided to take the little fellow to his home. He took him to a mansion where one room led to another, each grander and more luxurious than the last. The trembling, timid little fellow was given clothes the likes of which he had never seen. His adopted father took him to his room. There were silk sheets and coverlets and night light and all the beauties that wealth could bring to a boy's bedroom. The next morning the maid took him down to breakfast. There he ate food that he never knew existed, off beautiful plates with exquisite silverware. One morning the boy had taken all he could and when they went up to get him, they found nothing there but his good clothes. They looked for the old rags they'd taken from him, and they were gone. He'd taken off the rich, wealthy clothes that made him miserable and got back into his old rags. He was psychologically conditioned to dirt and rags. He was used to eating banana peels and crusts of bread. He wasn't conditioned to silk beds, fine clothes, and a rich, luxurious home. He was miserable there. In the same way, heaven would not be heaven to the man who does not have heaven in his heart. Heaven will not be heaven to the man who does not have the love of God in his heart. Heaven will be a place where God's love fills it as the atmosphere fills a room and covers it in rich, life-giving air. Heaven is filled with love, and whoever does not know the love of God on earth will not be happy in heaven. Certainly he will not be happy in hell, either. That's the horror of it. He won't be happy anywhere. I heard a great Canadian preacher years ago preach on the text, and it came to pass that the beggar, Lazarus, died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes. Luke chapter 16, verses 22 through 23. He asked why this was so and finally arrived at this conclusion. The poor man didn't go to Abraham's bosom because he was poor, and the rich man didn't go to hell because he was rich. 
each man went to the place that he had been conditioned for. Abraham's bosom was the place Lazarus belonged because Lazarus had the love of God in his heart. When he died, the love took him where he belonged. The rich man didn't go to hell because he ate sumptuously and lived in a good home. He went to hell because he did not have the love of God in his heart. When he died, he went to his place. There's a place for everybody. And love has opened the door for sinners to enter heaven. But wait a minute. Am I contradicting myself? Didn't I just say that sinful people, people of the world that don't have God's love, wouldn't be happy in heaven? Of course they wouldn't. But when you are saved, God changes your heart. The scripture says old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. God puts the seed of God in us, and we become children of God. We are baptized into the kingdom of God and thus become acclimated and psychologically conditioned to the kingdom of God. You love great hymns, you love to sing, you love to pray, you love to talk reverently about God. You love the sound of anthems and the sound of scripture being read. And nothing pleases you more than to get up in the morning and read your Bible. Nothing pleases you more than to have time with God in prayer, all you can get. If you live in the face of God, then you'll be happy in heaven, because you're conditioned for it. God has already made heaven your natural habitat. Bernard of Cluny's great hymn, The Celestial Country, in speaking of pilgrims that fought their way through to heaven, says that they will go to heaven because heaven demands them. Heaven demands them because they belong in heaven. Hell is a place where people go because they belong there. God doesn't get mad and say, get out of here and go to hell. No. They go where they belong by nature. The gravitational tug of their moral lives is toward hell. Those who die and go to heaven go there because the gravitational tug of their moral lives is toward heaven. By the blood of Jesus, the blood of the everlasting covenant. Talking about the love of God is like going around the globe, visiting every country in the world, then spending five minutes telling your friends about it. You can't do it. The love of God is so great that even preachers such as Spurgeon and Chrysostom cannot hope to rise in the oratory of the pulpit to do it justice. Julian of Norwich explained it this way, For our soul is so specially loved of him that is highest, that it overpasseth the knowing of all creatures. That is to say, there is no creature that is made that may fully know how much and how sweetly and how tenderly our Maker loveth us. And therefore we may with grace and his help stand in spiritual beholding with everlasting marvel of this high, overpassing, inestimable love that Almighty God hath to us of his goodness. Then she adds this little sentence, And therefore we may ask of our lover with reverence all that we will. He loves us so that no creature, neither seraphim, nor cherubim, nor archangel, nor principality, nor power, nor all of them added together in all the vast universe of God, can ever hope to know how overpassingly great is the love of God, and how tenderly, how sweetly, and how much he loves us. What can the world do to a man or woman who is grounded in the love of God, who swims in the ocean of his love as a fish in the mighty ocean? What can the devil do to a person like that? What can sin do? What can the world do? What can accident do? O oh, love of God, how little we know about it, and how little we do about what we know. May God help us. If you've been away from him, if you're backslidden or unsaved or unbelieving, dare to believe that God loves you. Dare to believe that he sent his only begotten son to give his life as a ransom for you. And dare to believe that if you'll trust in him, you shall have everlasting life. If you've been a wanderer from God, dare to come home. Don't add to your sins that you won't come home. A teenage girl gets an impulse to run away from home, so she takes off and gets a job somewhere in a restaurant. Then she reads in the paper or hears over the radio how her grieving mother wants her home, but she is so ashamed of herself that she feels it wouldn't be right to go home after doing what she did. Why should she add this one more crushing blow to her mother to refuse to come home when her mother wants her to come home? And why should you add this one more blow at the heart of God? Of course you don't deserve to come home, and yes, it looks cheap and little, and it's a humbling thing. But are you going to add one more sin to your account by refusing to believe that God loves you? God never took the lamp out of the window when you went away. It's still there. Every night he puts fresh oil in it, trims it and says, Maybe she'll come back tonight.
Maybe he'll be home tonight. It was said of the prodigal, and he arose and came to his father. Luke chapter 15, verse 20. Will you arise and come, whatever the need might be? Thank you for listening to this recording of The Attributes of God, Volume 2, by A. W. Tozer. This book was read by Michael Kramer. Please visit www.hovelaudio.com and www.christianaudio.com to offer your impressions of this work and to explore additional titles.